zooming in on uh, some of the aspects that uh, Dr. Kuru uh, was exploring in his, uh, in, in his talk. And uh, I will uh, talk about the very, very different ways how uh, political commentators, writers, novelists uh, have um, written about one particular chapter of late Ottoman history. So we are moving from uh, the 16th century, from the 1500s, from the, uh, from the century before, from the conquest of uh, Constantinople, into uh, the final century of the Ottoman Empire. And we are moving from the capital, uh, as it were, to the, uh, the borderlands, the, the very southern borderlands of the Ottoman Empire, uh, and more specifically, uh, to Southwest Arabia, to Yemen. And Yemen is a very curious case because uh, Yemen, um, or actually a, a, a larger portion than what is Yemen today, yeah, actually including parts of what uh, would be Saudi Arabia, was the very last a big ter territorial conquest that the Ottomans made in the 1840s, 1870s, and they managed to hang on to this portion of um, uh, Southwest Arabia to the very end of empire. Uh, and this is um, a time when the Ottomans on the world stage competed with um, very dynamic, very aggressive European imperial powers, and the Ottomans tried to match them in dynamism and, um, and expansionist qualities. And uh, Yemen was particularly important because for Ottoman planners, for Ottoman policymakers, it uh, was a, a buffer zone, a protective shield, as it were, uh, to a part of Arabia that was of uh, prime importance for the Ottomans ideologically, namely the holy sites of Islam uh, at Mecca and Medina, and controlling uh, those holy cities to which Muslims from all over the world made the annual pilgrimage, was one of the ways in which uh, Ottoman rulers, the Ottoman sultans, advertised themselves as more than secular rulers. Uh, this is how they gained legitimacy as leaders of the Muslim world, of Muslims worldwide. And this was a very, very important dimension of their being in the political world of the long 19th century, uh, because it allowed them uh, to uh, remind the British, the Dutch, the French, and the Russians, who had millions of uh, Muslim colonial subjects, uh, that uh, they, they shouldn't take uh, their, uh, their rule and their control over these peoples um, as much for granted as, uh, as they did. So uh, in, um, in recent years, uh, many historians, uh, and first and foremost, uh, perhaps my colleagues Gavin Brockett and Nicholas Stanforth, have demonstrated that from the early years of the, the Republic of Turkey, Turkish politicians, scholars, journalists, novelists, and filmmakers have interpreted aspects uh, of the Republic's Ottoman past in often vastly different ways in order to promote and, and uh, legitimize their own very different version of Turkish politics and society and the directions uh, they should take in the future. And uh, in this connection has been demonstrated uh, that um, beyond early interpretations that tended to juxtapose the reaction of the Ottoman past by Kabbalist elites during the first three decades of the Republic, the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, on one hand, and the promotion of a very different and more positive perspective on the Ottoman Empire by uh, Islamist activists and intellectuals from the 1980s. And especially uh, Brockett and Danforth, they have shed light on the tendency of early Republican nationalists to appropriate uh, Ottoman history by calling it Turkish. Uh, and uh, have pointed out that this was a very, very uh, particular uh, influential strand of uh, seeing the past and one that remains influential uh, today. And um, as Nick Danforth puts it, uh, quote, over the past decade, uh, Islamic politicians have done their best to solidify the empire's reputation for piety. Liberals have embraced the empire as a multicultural model for a more pluralistic Turkey, and many nationalists still see it as a proud uh, symbol of Turkish military might, end of quote. Now, at the same time, uh, these historians have primarily focused on the earlier centuries of the, uh, of the Ottoman Empire, and you will find uh, a, um, a lot of material that uh, brings uh, out how um, 
different um, parts of the Turkish public have debated and uh, have tried to make sense of the empire's 15th century history, of the con conquest of Constantinople, of uh, the kind of person that Sultan Mehmed II um, it was supposed to have been. And uh, at the same time, they uh, pay much less attention about events from the empire's final decades, uh, and they really do not venture very much into regions of the Ottoman Empire that today are not part of the Republic of Turkey. So in, in my uh, presentation, I will uh, take you, as I said, to the empire's southern borderlands, uh, to Yemen, away from uh, the, the capital Constantinople, slash Istanbul, uh, away from the battlefields of Gallipoli that have found a very, very... Um, important, definitive place in the, uh, in the Turkish national imagination. Uh, and uh, I argue that from uh, the last few decades of the Ottoman Empire, when more specifically from the 1908 Constitutional Revolution to, uh, to the present, um, Ottoman rule in Yemen has played an, uh, an, a very important role in late Ottoman and then the Turkish Republican imagination. It was first uh, useful as a laboratory uh, for a reformed, modern, and maybe even colonial Ottoman Empire, then as a case that highlighted the bankruptcy and dysfunctionality of the ousted imperial order. Um, alternatively, it was cast as a positive example of a Turkish-led Ottoman Empire in its last two decades. And finally, as a site that showcased, uh, beyond doubt, Turkish military heroism and sacrifice. So we start um, in the uh, years before uh, the beginning of World War I, 1914, and more specifically in the year 1908. And in, in the year 1908, a um, large military mutiny supported by a very significant chunk of the Ottoman civil bureaucracy forced Sultan Abdul Hamid, very quickly portrayed by Selim earlier on, to reinstate the constitution that he had suspended 30 years earlier. And um, this was a major event because it uh, dismantled a, a very, very large portion of uh, the Sultan's uh, autocratic regime, including press censorship. And uh, with the uh, disappearance of uh, press censorship, uh, we are dealing with a flood of new uh, magazines, uh, journals, newspapers, uh, book-length publications in all of the different uh, empires' different languages. Uh, from uh, Ottoman Turkish, the official language of the state, to Greek, Armenian, Arabic, um, and, and different Slavic languages. And uh, in the uh, three, four years following the reinstatement of the constitution, the return to constitutional monarchy, the election of an empire-wide um, parliament with representatives of all the different uh, religious and ethnic communities, uh, we see a very uh, sustained attempt to come to terms with the 30 years of rule of Abdul Hamid. And, um, and uh, if you're looking for a leitmotiv in many of these publications, newspaper commentary, uh, and so on, is that um, the empire has been taken off track by the Sultan. It has uh, turned into, uh, into a declining an, uh, empire very much threatened in its existence. And so uh, what, uh, what is very prominent in this kind of very voluminous and detailed commentary uh, is, um, are, are works ranging from newspaper articles to, um, uh, to, uh, to book lengths, um, uh, treatises, uh, if you will, uh, that make the point that Yemen is a perfect showcase uh, to show what is wrong with the Ottoman Empire under, under Abdul Hamid. And so what, um, what we are dealing with is um, a very large number of publications by Ottoman military men, by officers, uh, but also bureaucrats who um, had served uh, Abdul Hamid in Yemen and who are now finally, that censorship is gone, free to speak out. And so people like um, the Brigadier Rishi Pasha in his Memories of Yemen, or another military commander, Atif Pasha, in his History of Yemen, uh, they make the point that um, uh, Yemen 
conquered in the 1870s was nothing but a drain on the, the empire's uh, resources. Uh, it was uh, almost a constant strain of, uh, of military operations and wars. And indeed, um, uh, military attempts to control Yemen, which is very mountainous, it's very much like Afghanistan. It was uh, populated by um, tribal communities very used to their own independence and autonomy, um, was taken together probably the largest and most costly domestic war that the Ottomans fought uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. And there are estimates that uh, in those 40 odd years, some 100,000 Ottoman servicemen lost their lives in battle due to disease, starvation, etc. And, and so these um, problems are pointed out uh, by these authors, but they also do something else there. They um, argue that Yemen can be turned into a model province of the empire. It can be, if only it's governed uh, rightly, if the um, local traditions, the local customs are respected, Yemen can be productively integrated into the Ottoman Empire, uh, war can end, and um, it uh, can be a showcase for a remor uh, um, reformed Ottoman Empire, indeed. And in, um, in this connection, uh, these authors also uh, make a point that later commentators would come back to again and again. Uh, they um, point out that uh, in those 40 odd years that the Ottomans were trying to control Yemen, uh, a massive amount of Ottoman conscript soldiers died in, these, uh, in those military operations. And um, what is very interesting is that while uh, historians have actually shown quite clearly that um, the Ottoman wars in Yemen were very much imperial operations that reflected the, uh, the multi-ethnic and multi-religious makeup of the empire in the sense that conscripts came from Albania, they came from the Anatolian provinces, they came from Ottoman Syria and Palestine, uh, they were supported uh, by local tribal mercenaries and um, by um, uh, uh, an Ottoman military medical corps that was mainly staffed by the Greek and Armenian speaking Christian military do uh, doctors. These commentators chose uh, to highlight uh, the losses that the Anatolian conscripts had suffered. So it was very much narrowed down to um, the sacrifice of um, the Ottoman population, one particular part of the empire. And this was not um, entirely uh, by happenstance, because at the time there existed already a very powerful argument that um, Anatolian Turks in the Ottoman Empire uh, should take a, a more influential role in running the empire. Uh, considering Anatolian Turks as the backbone of the empire in terms of its military um, might and uh, administrative capabilities was a very uh, powerful strand in Ottoman political debate at the time. And um, a lot of those uh, political activists who wanted to return to a constitutional monarchy argued that, racially speaking, Turks were the best soldiers and the best administrators. Now, this was not a dominant political theme uh, because there were um, many others who were committed to the Ottoman Empire's multi-ethnic and multi-religious makeup, but it was something that was, it was an idea that was articulated more and more loudly and, and clearly um, at the time. So here we see this important emphasis on um, Turkish sacrifice on one side and uh, a better a reformed imperial future for Yemen in a, uh, in a reformed Ottoman Empire on the other. Now fast forward into um, the decades, the early decades of the Republic of Turkey into the 1920s and especially the 1930s. And uh, what we are dealing with here with is a fairly significant literature uh, of memoirs, where people who had served the empire either as soldiers or as bureaucrats uh, tried to come to terms uh, with the uh, events 
uh, until the empire's end and the, the proclamation of the republic. And uh, so what, um, what we are dealing with here is um, a group of, at some point, very influential men who are trying to rationalize uh, these um, events uh, in the last two decades of the Ottoman Empire that were very, uh, in, in, at this point, in a very, very recent past. And a good example for that is um, the last governor general of Yemen, Mahmoud Nadi Bey, uh, who serialized his memoirs in um, a very popular uh, Ottoman uh, newspaper in the 1930s, and he called it A Lifetime in Arabia, Arabistan uh, Babi Ogur. And uh, he used uh, different episodes of his life as an administrator in the service of Abdul Hamid and the young Turk um, uh, rulers of the Ottoman Empire who came after him to make the point that uh, when everything was said and done, the empire was highly dysfunctional. So he portrayed Abdul Hamid and his advisors as people who were incompetent, uh, who had uh, political obsessions about religious opposition, and um, the, uh, the leaders of uh, the Young Turk Committee of Union and Progress that became the leading political force in the empire uh, in its last 10 years is people who um, were really coining big slogans but didn't really care uh, all that much about rectifying the mistakes uh, that the Sultan had made. So for him, uh, telling stories, telling, um, sharing with his uh, readers these, ep uh, these episodes of his life as an administrator was a way to show that the empire was rotten from the inside that um, it was no wonder that it was replaced uh, by something else, something that looked healthier and more dynamic and, and um, had a much better chance of success, namely the, uh, the Turkish Republic. And of course it was for him, as for other uh, uh, memoir writers at the time, also a way to say, well, you know, I was part of the Ottoman apparatus, but I always told my superiors that uh, something was wrong, something had to be changed, but nobody listened to me. It was a way for him to, uh, to exculpate uh, himself. Now, um, we move about 20 years into the future, into the 1950s, when um, Turks uh, across the Republic celebrated the 500 year anniversary of the, the conquest of Constantinople, and we are in the early 1950s, and, um, and this is when uh, former administrators, soldiers, bureaucrats, doctors, engineers, who had served the empire uh, in Yemen, had spent the best years of their lives, essentially, uh, in this Arab borderland, uh, when they are retirees, when they're in their 60s and their 70s, and um, when they're worried. They're worried that uh, what they have done and their life experience and that of um, uh, those conscript soldiers who served in, uh, in Arabia is likely to be forgotten. And they have a point, because this is a time when uh, in the Turkish historical imagination, uh, World War I looms large, especially uh, the Ottoman victories at Gallipoli against the British, the French, and their uh, imperial armies, uh, the, uh, the victories over the British uh, Indian forces at Kota Lamara in 1915, and uh, even more importantly, uh, the war of independence in the immediate aftermath of World War I how, um, threatening to overshadow uh, their formative experience as adults, namely serving the Ottoman Empire in Yemen. And so um, people like former military prosecutor uh, Ziki Iloulou or uh, a, a former uh, communications officer, Asaf Tanrakut, uh, at the end of their lives, they uh, write down their memoirs, and they do something which is very, very interesting. Uh, they, almost like oral historians today, they uh, write to those of their old colleagues and comrades um, they still know was still alive, and they say, well, can you write me a letter uh, with, uh, that summarizes in a few pages your impressions, what it was like to serve in Yemen, what it, like, what it was like to be a soldier there, what it was like to be a district officer, and um, they do this, and in a very much uh, scrapbook, patchwork kind of way, they produce these, uh, these memoirs 
um, that pull together the observations, the memoirs of many people. Um, they too find Yemen, remembering Yemen, remembering Yemen as part of the Ottoman Empire, useful, but for very different reasons than the commentators in 1908, 1909, 1910, and people like Mahmoud Nadim in the 1930s. They find it important because they don't want um, the, the service of the, the conscript soldiers there to be forgotten. Uh, they are worried that um, with the, the war and the war of independence being so prominent, nobody will talk about them anymore, nobody will remember them, uh, because there are no um, military cemeteries, as opposed to what is going on in Gallipoli. There are no ceremonies on a, on a yearly basis. And, um, and so uh, they are trying to write back Ottoman Yemen into uh, the consciousness, into the um, uh, sort of remember recorded history uh, that um, educated people in the Republic know. And their starting point is something very interesting. It is folklore. Uh, their starting point is um, a particular genre of uh, Anatolian folk songs, the Yemen songs, the Yemen Turkulevi, that always have one particular theme. It is the mourning, uh, the distress, uh, the pain about loved ones, brothers, fathers, sons, who uh, serve as con conscripts in Yemen, who are most likely not to come back. And uh, the starting point for people like Hiro and Tamil Kut is, well, you know, we know about these folk songs. Um, our folklorists they have published them. We now have record, uh, uh, recordings of them. We listen to them sometimes on the radio. But uh, hardly anybody knows the story behind this. Let me tell you the story behind the Yemen songs. Uh, and in doing that, uh, in um, recording, uh, the history of the people behind those folk songs, uh, they are also erasing um, the imperial history of Yemen. Because Yemen becomes suddenly a quintessentially Turkish experience. And the Arab conscripts, the Bosnian conscripts, the Albanian conscripts, um, and the local uh, mercenaries, for example, uh, disappear uh, from, uh, from this record becomes a quintessentially Turkish experience exemplified in a particular genre of Turkish folklore. And um, highlighting especially the war, World War I in Yemen, is also uh, something extremely useful for those um, uh, former bureaucrats and, uh, and officers in the 1950s and 1960s. Because um, the war in Yemen went well for the Ottomans, and it ended well. It went well because they, uh, quite decisively, threw the British uh, in Arabia on the defensive, and the British couldn't do really a lot until um, the Ottoman Empire had to capitulate in 1918, and the Ottomans, because they were defeated elsewhere, had to surrender. In Yemen, they remained undefeated in the field. A very big um, sort of uh, psychologically a very, very important point. The other point uh, that made Yemen so important, or the other two points, I should say, are these. Uh, Yemen, the war in Yemen was a clean war. It was, uh, there were no mass killings of civilians. Uh, there were no summary executions of local leaders who were uh, suspected of nationalist treason. And uh, so this war, this could be easily, more easily represented as a clean war that the Ottomans fought uh, against their, uh, their, British, uh, their British adversaries. And finally, it was something that they felt more people should know about is because um, in Yemen, uh, the Ottomans managed before the war to uh, end set, uh, decades of conflict with uh, local tribal communities, with local leaders, and they came to a peace settlement in 1911 that lasted throughout the war. And uh, the most prominent of the local leaders, the Shia Imam Yahya, is quoted in one of those books, and see, he, he, he those, the Turks in Yemen, I will be sharing my last piece of bread with the Ottoman state, if I have to. And so, uh, so this was a stark contrast to the Arab uprising of the Sharif of Mecca, Hussein ibn Ali, 
1916. This was a sharp contrast to the supposedly um, uh, nationalist subversion in Ottoman Iraq and Palestine, and uh, to the uh, opposition of the Idrisi Amir in Assyria and part of today Saudi Arabia. So uh, it's no uh, wonder that in 1992, the prominent Turkish daily newspaper Milliyet ran a story uh, that had the headline, Yemen, the only Arab country that stayed loyal to us. And historically, everything is wrong with that sentence, but it gives you a, a very, very um, good impression of how this kind of writing, one memory production, stated our Yemen as a positive chapter in, the, in, late, Ottoman, in late Ottoman history. And uh, so what we are dealing with here is um, in highlighting uh, the sacrifice, the positive aspects of the Ottoman Empire, these people um, zoomed in, as it were, on uh, the, the commentary and the discussions from the early 1900 and um, took out those portions uh, that uh, really served their political agenda to the exclusion of everything else. So it became a much narrower vision. And um, if you go into the 2010s, into the very, very recent past, you see something equally interesting. You see a proliferation, very large number of um, Scholar, scholarly or semi-scholarly work, historical novels, and the republication of all of these other works, of Rishi Pasha's uh, Memories of Yemen, Atif Pasha's History of Yemen, Mahmoud al um, uh, 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 Benoit's, uh, and the books by Ehil Luas, uh, Tan Rukut, and others. They all republish and new works being created, um, especially historical novels. And uh, these historical novels take an even kind of narrow focus. They all focus on Yemen as a side of Turkish heroism, of military kahramanlik, and, um, and it is in the um, preface, in the introductory paragraphs of his um, book about a uh, Turkish or Turkoman tribal leader, Mihrali Bey, that um, uh, Cengiz Chakalulu says, uh, Turks throughout history, since the, uh, the Middle Ages, have always produced military heroes. Uh, and let me tell about um, one of them from the recent past, uh, and, and, and the side of his heroism, Yemen. And I'm sure he concludes the book that my story of Mehrali Bey will be, will be, uh, will be a, f a phenomenal, a fantastic um, historical series for television. And I look forward to seeing him on the big screen. And so, um, so here is someone who wants to insert Yemen into a genre that Silim uh, just uh, highlighted for us early on in his, in his commentary, namely uh, that uh, progressively we see in particular images, particular interpretations of Ottoman history um, popularized as soap operas, as TV series, or in, as uh, historical documentaries. And I leave it there and um, hand on the mic to our um, third presenter, our very own Alim uh, Bizantar. Thank you so much.